Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Overcoming Operational Challenges, How Intentional Planning Leads to Patient Diversity in Clinical Trials. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and the presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. Now, the webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you get involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance along the way, you can also contact me at any time by sending a message using this same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode, and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Cineos Health, who developed the content for this presentation. Cineos Health is the only fully integrated biopharmaceutical solutions organization, including a contract research organization, CRO, and contract commercial organization, CCO. Together, they share insights, use the latest technologies, and apply advanced business practices to speed customers' delivery of important therapies to patients. And so now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker today, Nick Kenny, Chief Scientific Officer of Cineos Health. Nick, you may begin when you're ready. Ryan, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to all of our audience for joining us today for what I hope will be a very interesting and interactive dialogue with some experts from across the industry. If you can move to the next slide, please, Ryan. Just to share with everybody, this is the second in a series of four presentations that we've been fortunate to put together with leaders from a broad spectrum of our clinical trials industry, as you can see uh, in the bullets here. And really the intention of this four part dialogue is to develop a sort of a community engagement about what can we do better together to demolish some of the barriers that have prevented us from achieving meaningful change around patient diversity in clinical trials. So last week we heard from Dr. Stephen Keith, Dr. Fabian Sandoval and Tisha Johnson about some of the on the ground uh, issues we face with health and healthcare disparities that impact our ability to find patients. Today, we're gonna to really focus on what are some of the operational challenges that clinical delivery leads face, both from a site perspective and pharmaceutical perspective and staff. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll hear some success stories by people who've had a good result with intentional planning and engaging all stakeholders. And then we'll wrap up on the 17th of February, think about what is next? How do we get patient diversity really be the new normal and not something that we're fighting to achieve? How do we make it an integral part of everything that we do. So if you can go to the, the next slide, please, Ryan. It really is a privilege to introduce our panelists today, uh, a broad base of experience. So Kathy Traz joins us from BMS, where she heads up global advocacy. Uh, under Kathy's leadership, BMS have really tackled an important component of what we need to talk about today, which is how to incorporate patient voice into clinical development planning. Uh, Kathy brings a very broad set of experience uh, from her career beginning in the New Jersey State House and a variety of activities after that. She also had a prominent role at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society before moving on to a GSK and Bristol Myers Squibb. Wendy McCaskill joins us from the National Cancer Institute, um, where she is a medical oncologist and chief of the Community Oncology and Prevention Trials. And I think importantly for today, what has been instrumental in the community outreach and court program seeking to drive clinical trial opportunities out into the community where patients are in need and to ensure diversity in doing that. And again, WERTA has a very broad uh, perspective on this, beginning at WashU uh, with overseas training. She's been recognized by many important bodies, including the American Association for Cancer Research for her work, not just in oncology, but in advancement of minority investigators into cancer research. Julian Jenkins joins us from Insight Corporation, where he is Vice President and Head of Development Operations, running a team that has a broad-based remit to advanced therapies in oncology and inflammation and autoimmunity. And Julian, again, brings a tremendous breadth of experience from over 30 years in and around the industry, including time at GlaxoSmithKline and involved in HIV research. And then finally, Jim Kremitis joins us from the ACRP, where he's an Executive Director Again, Jim has a broad-based experience across patient recruitment, both in CROs and from a 24-year career 
at Eli Lilly. And importantly, Jim has also been engaged in initiatives such as those driven by the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, a joint venture between Duke and the FDA. And CTTI has been heavily featured uh, in examining patient uh, disparity into clinical trials. So without further ado, let's get started. And Kathy, I think I'd like to begin with you. If we can go to the next slide, maybe you can lead us off and give us the BMS perspective about how you set about making intentional change to incorporate patient voice into everything that you do. Yeah, well, thank you, Nick. Um, and really happy to be here today. Thank you for the invite. Um, as you mentioned, I lead patient advocacy at Bristol Myers Squibb and um, in working with our advocacy uh, leaders across the globe and across disease areas, um, we, we had heard back from them that BMS had kind of, you know, quite the gap in uh, early engagement with advocates uh, at the company. Not that we didn't do any early engagement, we just weren't very consistent about it. So what the advocacy team did was uh, came up with an idea to build a systematic approach, um, which we named PEER, of course, um, because it's pharma, we always have to have an acronym. So uh, PEER actually stands for the Patient Expert Engagement Resource. So again, enterprise-wide approach um, to bring the patient voice into the company um, across all of development and commercialization. So we um, set about by outlining those points of engagement of where people um, can bring that patient voice in, which is basically almost any point, um, you know, throughout um, uh, development and commercialization. And then um, look at the, the, the opportunities, again, of where the experts in advocacy can really give that feedback. So many advocates are, have been trained in drug development, um, whether that be in the, on the regulatory side or even um, on protocol um, reviews and protocol development. Some advocates have been very much trained um, in the HTA space, so the health technology assessment space. Um, or even data generation. So we, as the advocacy team, were able to work with the advocacy groups um, and contract you know, with them. Um, and we have, I think it's something, I think we have 34 organizations across the world um, that we've contracted with. So whenever we have a question, we will go to them and ask who their best expert is. Um, if the expert agrees to give us some time, it could be just a quick call, it could be, you know, a review of a protocol, which might take a little longer. Whatever time that they uh, give us, we will then reimburse the organization directly, so the nonprofit. So um, that's, been a, that's been a really nice opportunity. Um, then internally, which is probably the organizational overhaul that you're talking about on this, <laughs> on this webinar, um, we actually had to get our um, senior leaders involved um, and our chief medical officer actually mandated that uh, after March of last year, um, he would not sign off on any pivotal trial protocol reviews unless they had, uh, unless they had a peer review, which was hugely helpful for us in communicating this, um, you know, this new <laughs> initiative and uh, where we could put our stake in the, in the, in the ground. Um, and we're now working with our chief commercial officer and um, of course our early development uh, leader on some opportunities there. And if you go to the next slide, I have a couple of slides here. Um, some of the areas where we're focused, as you can imagine, um, with the advocates, as I mentioned, clinical trial op optimization, um, you know, and looking at the protocol or the synopsis, um, to make sure that patient perspective is 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 included, um, but you can see all of the other areas that we've already had um, great feedback from the advocates on um, throughout our company. So those are just some of the work streams that that we have now, and there's there's more added every day. Every time somebody from the company finds out about Peer. Um, which was launched by our CEO in, in an internal meeting. But when they hear about it and they say, oh my goodness, you know, I wanna, I wanna get involved because it's not so much the fact that people didn't want to get patient uh, <laughs> feedback. Sometimes they just are working so fast or working in their own area that they just didn't know how to go about it. So the more we communicate about this, the more work streams you'll see pop up. So next, um, 
Next slide, please. So, again, because, um, you know, we're learning and uh, growing this opportunity, we do want it to become a little bit more efficient um, for our advocates specifically. So we're looking at, you know, potentially a virtual platform. Right now we're doing this via phone calls or emails um, um, or even meetings like this. Uh, but we do want to have it uh, to be a, just a little bit more convenient for the advocates. Of course, we're also looking at diversity and health equity uh, because that's so important and a big part of our future at BMS um, with our objectives in, in health equity. So we need to make sure we're including the right stakeholders, um, not just the experts, but um, across all areas um, and landscapes. And that even includes um, geographically and making sure we're including other um, of our countries as well. So it's not just the US, we actually have global organizations involved too. And then again, you know, continuing to communicate and um, look at uh, the metrics so that we can continue to improve. And then the last slide that I have here <coughs> is really some of the successes that I mentioned. So we launched in May of 2020, um, again, our CEO uh, announced uh, this initiative at our town hall in May, and we've already pulled it into trainings, um, different meetings, lots of presentations. It's going to be featured actually this week at our global leadership team meeting, and we've already had, you know, over 23 engagements, like I said, with 20 expert advocates on the on the uh, work streams that I mentioned before. So again, just trying to make this um, as easy and convenient as possible, uh, more virtual, hopefully, and um, of course, inclusive for, for all of our stakeholders. So it was it was a long haul, took us a couple of years. Um, but honestly, it's been so success, successful, we had never imagined, and it's going to continue to grow. And, and we're sharing it all over the place so that um, other companies, if they want to take up the same kind of you know initiative process uh, system we'd love for, to see them do it as well so and Kathy, no, Kathy thank you I think that's an excellent lead off and I just want to pull out a few a few important things that I think you've touched on I think first and foremost you know it's critical that you have leadership who are committed to this and I love the fact that your leadership is stipulating that this has to happen right because you don't get organizational change without that kind of commitment I think it's really impressive too to look at all the different work streams you've got because it's important that I think everybody recognizes the broad touch that is required to enact patient diversity. It's not just one group that has to be complete. And then I think lastly, you know, the fact that you create this sort of a central resource that your clinical teams to go, can go to because we all know how busy clinical teams are simply delivering their work. So by yeah. creating that central approach, you're, you're drawing people into the equation instead of sort of putting another challenge ahead of them. So I think that's wonderful. And then lastly, you know, the fact that BMS, I think, is so openly sharing success and planning and sort of giving away the secret sauce to help other people, I think is an important part of what we need to do together as a community. So thank you so much for that. Um, My pleasure. I think if we can move forward, what I'd like to move to, to your work with NCI and NCORP um, because clearly, you know, from a cancer standpoint, we've known for some time about the, the terrible disparities in health and healthcare outcomes in oncology, and that, you know, patients are out in the community that we simply can't get to. And so I think the work that you began, I think back in 2014 with NCOR, to drive trials out into the community where patients are, I think is very, very illustrative for me about the intentional change that is required at the study site level. So maybe you could share with us some of that journey and, and what you've gotten out of that. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, so I am uh, presenting on the, the NCI Community Oncology Research Program, which is the single uh, clinical trial network that provides access to um, adults and children uh, with cancer or at risk of cancer. And so um, I, I wanted to show you on our first uh, slide exactly what we're really taking to the community because our approach uh, has been access. Uh, number one, and to make sure that uh, we can provide the best access, access to, to patients um, in, in their own communities. And so our clinical trials and, and studies are, are relatively broad. So we have uh, trials related to symptoms of cancer and cancer treatment, palliative care, 
Uh, we have large uh, prevention and surveillance trials um, and quality of life embedded into treatment. So our, our networks are actually charged to enroll about half. So about half of the uh, trials are non-treatment trials and the others are a, a portfolio as I have just shared with you. Um, so we also participate in advanced imaging trials with tissue and as well. And I think importantly what I wanted to share with you is, is the changes that are happening and how the community has to adapt to um, a new approaches to clinical research such as uh, tissue acquisition studies that are looking at various ways of, of, of moving the field forward in terms of precision medicine. And, and it's important because we want to make sure that these new technologies are feasible, can be done in the community, and that the investigators are comfortable in doing them, and more importantly, having the infrastructure to conduct them. So in 2014, we also added a very unique part to our portfolio, and that has to do with cancer care delivery research. It came quite a resistance. Although the sites were talking about cancer care delivery, they just you know, thought, oh, what is this cancer care delivery research? It's not chemotherapy, and it's not this and that. But actually, I think the timing has been great because we were able to look at the impact of providers as well as organizations. We have a tremendously diverse uh, organization of oncology practices. We look at disparities throughout all of our research portfolio and, and in order to help us, for example, facilitate a better understanding of symptom management, for example, um, you know, we have not been as, as successful as in treatment in, in targeting um, or able to predict uh, who's going to respond or who gets various uh, symptoms and adverse events from our interventions. And so we established a bank to allow us to look more mechanistically for those studies um, and also the uh, imaging support that we needed for our trials. Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> So we are a vast network. We uh, traverse uh, 43 states, Guam and Puerto Rico. Um, we have over 1,000 physicians and about 9,000 if you add in the important healthcare team of nurses, et cetera. And um, we're at over 1,000 sites. It doesn't look like it on this, on this uh, map, but let me just share with you. If you look toward North Carolina, for example, we have a grantee there that traverses uh, across four states and has about 78 affiliated sites. So this is the breadth by which we uh, uh, um, cover the country. Now, 14 of our 46 sites are really focused on areas that have high enrollment of uh, high catchment areas of racial ethnic minorities or rural populations. And that's one of the um, uh, approaches that we have taken to try to enroll or enhance our enrollment of minorities enrollment. This doesn't mean that the other sites don't have significant amounts of uh, racial ethnic minorities and other underserved populations. But these are the applicants who uh, have traditionally either had safety net hospitals or are new uh, healthcare systems that are located in areas that can meet those criteria, which is 30%. Um, so that's who we are across the country. The next slide. <clears throat> So how successful have we been? So what you can see on the uh, left hand on of the slide is that for the general uh, in core, depending upon the year, the overall mining enrollment is about 16%. For those sites that are focused on minority, the minority enrollment is 55%. And we've recently looked at uh, uh, minority enrollment across the NCI over 20 years. And for minority, minority enrollment, Average across those 20 years is about 19%, and we've seen significant enrollment, such that if you look at the past three years, we've actually gotten to 27% uh, for phase three trials. Um, and we broke it down by racial ethnic groups. It's about 9% overall for African Americans, increased over the, the more recent years, and obviously varies across the uh, different uh, uh, disease sites. And for uh, Hispanics, it's overall about eight or nine percent over those years. So I think that's an approach that we've taken. It's it's been interesting, uh, and I think one of the lessons that we've learned is as the community practices change, and they're changing very rapidly, uh, we've had to uh, be very proactive in engaging the CEOs in uh, in understanding. Uh, one, the transition between um, pharma trials and NCI supported trial and the associated and probably prolonged uh, policies um, 
with FDA and other regulatory uh, policies as well. Um, but I think that uh, one of the things, because we have such a broad portfolio, is um, really stressing the importance of reaching out to the, the um, community that they serve and, and engaging really the appropriate people. Um, you know, one might think if you have an in-core in, let's say, um, Minneapolis, um, that every single patient is going to be referred to that in-core. Well, that's not the case because it really based upon the referral patterns, and we know that there have been social issues related to that. So these are some of the things that we have um, and learned. And then I think, of course, because of the complexity of the country has changed, we're very sensitive about language. As I mentioned, we have a very huge portfolio in assessing and ameliorating uh, cancer symptoms. And, and we find a lot of those tools are not translated in anything but English. So we're trying to get away from a study coming in saying only English speakers only. And, and so we've had to uh, seek ways in which we can uh, help those sites by, by translating uh, to the extent that we can and also thinking about the funding that might be um, needed to them to do the more nuances of translations at the site level. So I'm going to pause there and, and uh, hopefully entertain questions. No, that's a, that's a great summary, Walter. Thank you. I, just again, I want to pull out a couple of things. I mean, you know, you guys have obviously made a, a significant impact in the runway that you've had with NCOR. And I think particularly when I think about the, the biobank and sampling, how important that is, I think, in two directions, right? So one, as you pointed out, so that we can take precision medicine out into community oncology centers, but also I think in ob obtaining a, a much more diverse set of biobank samples to try and balance out how we develop precision medicines. Because I've seen somewhere some startling statistics that many of the drugs that we're looking at now were developed with samples that were largely derived from Caucasians. And so we don't really have a good sense of what might be different as we broaden that out. We, you know, there's a sort of a gap in our biology of knowledge. And I think something else that really strikes me, you mentioned about the, the changes in community practices, the demography of our country changes quite rapidly. Uh, I think that's got to be critical as we go forward. So I think a great perspective word. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so Julian, maybe switching gears a little bit, I'd love to move to you and, and what you've been trying to engender with your clinical teams at Insight, particularly as you said about a sort of a proactive but practical approach to include diversity planning and the broad-based uh, work that you do across oncology and inflammation and autoimmunity. So maybe you could share what you've been trying to accomplish. Yeah, thanks, Nick, and, and thanks for uh, for having me here today to represent the team. Uh, we don't have a, a cool acronym like uh, like Kathy's team yet, but that, you know we have a trial diversity group that works within Insight, mainly people from development operations, but including people from the rest of the organisation. Uh, we'd begun this just last year um, after I'd arrived at the company, um, and then obviously with the events of 2020, with uh, the, you know the disparities in the healthcare and the outcomes in in COVID-19 and the the events were around George Floyd's killing. I think it sort of raised the whole profile of disparities um, generally in the U.S. and particularly within within healthcare. Um, and then we got a lot of um, senior management buy-in. So what Kathy shared resonated strongly. Where uh, our chief executive and others all sort of drove uh, this sort of consciousness within within the organization. And as I reflect on it as well, I think just as a member of the public, this was for the first time raised in the public domain. I think um, I, I did a couple of presentations earlier in the year where we had screenshots of CNN. So this is in the public consciousness now with the vaccine trials and, and some of the, the missed opportunities there as well. So I think the whole profile of it has been raised and there's a real opportunity for us in clinical research to do a much better job of conducting our studies in a representative population for a given disease. So one of the ways that we're trying to practically go after this is to ensure that all uh, projects and studies have a, a diversity plan in place which is built off a really deep understanding of the epidemiology and the demographics of that particular population that needs to get studied in that particular protocol. So, and once you know that, the challenge then for that team is to match that demographics when they conduct that study. Um, and we have put in 
place a, a number of um, sort of business intelligence tools that allow us to sort of track this um, in real time and then also then select sites, select investigators, select regions of the country uh, that we would focus on um, in particular so that we could ensure that patients there understand the research is going on and can get access to the sites and so on. So we've got a pretty detailed set of plans uh, that we can work from and obviously we're really helped by a whole series of guidances that have been around for, for more than half a decade from the likes of, of Transcelerate, from uh, ACRO, MRCT, etc. So there's a lot out there, there's a lot of literature, City as well is published in this area. So it's not like you need to sort of create a way of doing this yourself, it already exists, it's very digestible, it's Unfortunately, it's quite obvious as well in terms of the actions you could take. So uh, we're just trying to follow that and apply it and do it on every study every time and, and, uh, and focus on it hopefully to improve. And my dog is joining in, I apologize. So that was me uh, coming to the end of my piece there as introduction, Nick. Hopefully that gives you an understanding of how we're trying to make it yeah. practical uh, for our group. No, it does, Julian. I want to I echo, I think, some of the things I've heard you say there. So one, about the practicality of this, right? So it's important that we make sure that all the operations teams we work with know that this is doable, right? And as you pointed out, if you're applying data and business intelligence to it, so you can do overlays of the disease burden and study sites and in hospitals where that disease burden exists, then you can go there intentionally instead of going back to the same old source we used to do, just open a bunch of sites up and see who enrolls, right? So it's that intentional plan. And I think, you know, you brought up some other great points there, Julian, about there is a lot of great information already out there, right? Whether it's the work that the Transcelerate team did several years ago, or the new, very, I think, thoughtful guidance that came from MRCT, from the folks at Harvard, which was a multi-stakeholder document from the agency, from pharma, from academics, from study sites. That's like a roadmap of how to, and even the FDA's guidance is pretty explicit about giving you flexibility to think about things like inclusion and exclusion. So I think it is important the way you guys have said about it to make it very practical for your teams and more of a can do than another hurdle to be gotten over, right? And that's, that to me is an important sort of mind shift that our clinical teams really need to have. So thank you for that perspective. Um, Jim, switching gears a little bit, you know, I think we often hear about the sort of terrible underrepresentation of minority groups as physicians out in the, out in the world, right? I mean. I saw, I think, JAMA or New England Journal just document that still 5% of MDs in the U.S. are still African-American. That's a number that hasn't changed probably in 30 or 40 years, which is tragic. And so I think there is becoming, thankfully, a lot more focus on that and support for physicians. But what about the rest of the workforce? Because I know you deal with sort of the CRA and other angles of it. What do you see needing to change in our clinical workforce as they interact with study sites? How are you guys going about that from ACRP? Oh, well, thanks, Nick. Um, it's a great question. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of work around how we recruit minority populations into trials, actually for many years. I mean, we were looking at this when I was at Lilly back in 2005. We had a physician there at the time, her name, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, and uh, she was very uh, adamant about this in the trials that she was overseeing at that point in time. Um, so, but one of the things that we learned and I'm going to jump to this, and then I'll come back and tell a little bit about ACRP. One of the things we learned was when we hired investigator sites to do our studies from Hispanic populations or African-American, lo and behold, those were the sites that tended to enroll the patients from those populations. So it's not rocket science. The difficulty is how do you grow those people in the work or grow that portion of the workforce? So let me, let me tell you a little bit about ACRP, and then I'll come back to what we're trying to do in order to grow the diversity of our clinical research workforce, particularly at the site level. Um, first of all, we're a not-for-profit. We were founded in 1976, and our goal really is to enhance the quality and, of ethical, responsible clinical research being done every, everywhere across the world. Now, how do we do that? We focus on the workforce, and what I mean by the workforce is the PIs, the study coordinators, <laughs> the site monitors, so all of the individuals who are literally executing the protocols, literally taking that protocol, dealing with the patients, capturing the data, consenting the patients, et cetera. And we've got about 13,000 members in our association 
we also have a, um, a certification organization. We've got another 13,000 there, which about 60% overlap. They're members of the association and they're certified. Um, and I'll point out to you the, the quote at the bottom there, the workforce is not large enough or adequately trained. So that's where our focus is. Next slide. I mean, if you look at what's going on in the industry on, on a macro level these days, we all know that it takes too long, it costs too much, we're inefficient. I mean, I can, I can go on and on. There was an interesting city paper that just came out the other day about the inefficiency just around COVID studies. Um, but, you know, we're looking at process improvements through things like City, Transcelerate, you know, the Avoca Group. There's quite a few organizations that are cross-industry organizations that are trying to uh, collaborate to, to streamline processes. At the same time, there's a plethora of new technologies coming out. I mean, I don't even need to tell you. There's something new practically every day. And when you look at change management 101, there's basically three legs to the stool, processes, tools, and people. And so what we want to do is be the organization that can help transition people into the new arena of these new processes and technologies. Obviously included in that is growing the workforce to bring new people in. So next slide. Uh, there's three major areas that, we, that we're focused on. One is growing and diversifying the workforce, and I'll come back to that. The second is enhancing the competency of, of the workforce overall. Uh, just a quick point, if, if you ask somebody, how did you get into clinical research, more than 90% of the time they'll say, eh, I just kind of fell into it. And if you say, well, how were you trained? You, they'll go, well, it was kind of on the job training, you know, and I took a few GCP classes. And there's no consistent manner that we bring people in and develop those people. So one of the key things we're trying to do is, and by the way, this came out of MRCT. We took the MRCT competency framework, and we're defining by each role what the competencies ought to be. So we're defining the competencies, getting alignment across the industry, we're not doing this in a vacuum. It's a collaboration to define those competencies by role and then make sure we can validate that individuals have those competencies. So define, align, and validate, which makes a great acronym if you add the word educate at the end. It's DAVE. I love acronyms. By the way, ACRP is an acronym. <laughs> so DAVE is what, kind of what we're trying to do in the middle there. And then on the far right, sustaining the workforce, what we don't want to see is people coming in and going out. You know, we want to make sure there's career paths so that folks can progress through their careers and, and that we create a profession of clinical research. Currently, uh, the Bureau of Labor <clears throat> Statistics, there is no profession called clinical research or clinical research. It's, and considering the fact that there are tens of thousands of people that do this in the United States alone, it's amazing that this doesn't exist. So just... A, a sidebar. Now, I want to point out what we're doing specifically to try to grow the diversity of the workforce. Um, we have an, a campaign that is targeted towards college and high school students um, that is called the Elements, Find Your Element Campaign. And we're primarily focusing on uh, African American and Hispanic students with the idea of introducing to them the clinical research as a career option so that they begin thinking about it early in their choices, going through their, you know, how they're looking at their, where their life is going to take them. So it's been extremely successful. We've only run it in a handful of markets because it really just depends on how much, you know, money we have in order to, to buy the media. But it's primarily an online campaign. And again, it's called the Elements Campaign. We've had a, close to 100,000 people come to our website seeking more information about being a clinical researcher. So if anybody's interested, I'm more than happy to spend a lot of time on that talking to you about it. Um, the other thing that we did was we created a um, what we're calling our Diversity Advisory Council. And this group is focused on three primary areas. One, bringing new people into the workforce, like I just described. Two, uh, people who are in minority populations currently in the workforce, how can we help them thrive? How can we help them advance their careers? And then three, how can we educate organizations or employers about the value and the business opportunities, return on investment of having these type of people in your workforce? So those are the three primary areas uh, we're working. And one quick example, 
we partnered with uh, Black Women in Clinical Research and ran a seminar a couple weeks ago teaching them how to enhance the quality of their resume. So as they're looking for new jobs as maybe a study coordinator or maybe as a CRA, they're presenting themselves in the most positive light. And then what we've done is we've got uh, a, a, a group of mentors who are now in a follow-up meeting gonna spend 15 minutes with any of these folks that would like to have their resume reviewed and get immediate feedback online, one-on-one. -on -one. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So that's the whole question of how do you enhance the existing workforce to be more competitive to, again, you know, present themselves properly for employers. Thank you for that. That's, that's a great tool to force. And I, I think, you know, you've really nailed it when you talk about creating those mentorship programs and sort of positive cycles of reinforcement so people can not just see the careers, but make sure we do represent those careers to a, a demography that is representative of our population, right? So there's an equitable access into the workforce. And it starts to self-feed then, right? Because if people have a mentor who looks like them and, and understands the community, and it spins up and then that spins out into the site and you're much more likely, you know, to have a positive interaction with patients who are thinking about a trial and you can start coupling things together. So uh, thank you for that great overview. I mean, I think the work you guys are doing is, is tremendously important. And I do, I do have to chuckle with everybody else on the phone that it's the most lucrative, invisible career there is on the planet, I think. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, if I could add one more bit of data that everyone might find interesting, we did a study that showed that the the, the work requirements or the or the volume of work in clinical research is growing at about 12 percent per year in terms of the number of trials that need to be executed, mm -hmm. whereas the workforce itself is only growing at nine percent. So <laughs> if we can continue to grow the workforce to make up that gap, I, I can almost guarantee the sponsors on this call you can never find enough investigators if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> There's always there's all this competition and challenge. We need more investigators. We need more investigator staff, and that's one of the things we're trying to improve. Yeah. So actually, Jim, as we transition, I think into more of an open dialogue between all of us on the panel here. You know, the parallels be what, between what you're trying to do with your workforce approach here and, and efforts, say, like those that Kathy. I know the BMS Foundation has just given a huge grant to the National Medical Fellowships to pull through their their program to now train minority groups about doing cl clinical research. And I think it's really gonna be joined up efforts like that that are gonna help us sort of begin to move the needle and get better access. But I think what it highlights perhaps for me that I'd like to throw this open to all of you, I think as an industry, one of the biggest blind spots we still have is we don't have enough knowledge about the study sites we work with, the patients they represent, and how perhaps articulate or not many of them are in terms of community outreach to engage minority groups, right? And we've certainly seen, I think, good examples of some institutions that have made intentional change. You know, we're, we're gonna be hearing next week from the folks at Emory. We heard last week from the folks at Yale. But as you guys collectively think about what we might do differently to better work with study sites and understand their capabilities, what do you think we need to, to change? Maybe Julian, I'll start out with you. Yeah, I think it's a it's a key question, and I for me, I think it's it's have that question in mind to start. So as I pick these sites, am I going after uh, what percentage of patients do I need that fit a certain demographic, and where are the best places to find that? And actually, anecdotally, the last site visit I did before we all got locked down for COVID was back in February, and it was a a university academic center in a in an urban setting, and it had a so the university campus included the medical school. It also included the School of Social Work. And it was a, a really, we had a great conversation. It was about trial diversity and how do we reach it within, within that particular city. Um, and it, teaming up the medical team and the clinical research team with the social work team where they're already doing outreach for general health care, let alone clinical yeah. research, just general health care. Uh, you know, some patients' uh, inability to travel or unwillingness to travel, even within the confines of a relatively small city uh, for safety reasons and, and, and other economic reasons and so on. So mm -hmm. it, I, I think if you go in with the intent, you ask the question, and then you find institutions or places or organizations like the ones we've been like, like Waters Organization, for example, have that dialogue and start to think about where you would place them. You, you'd, you'd find, you'd pick very different sites 
probably with different investigators back to what Jim was saying earlier and what you were just reinforcing, Nick. So I think all of those things sort of combine together. And I think the more of them that you do, the more intent you have and the more of those various things we've been talking about you do, the, 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 the increased chances you have of being able to find patients, get them to find your study, be willing to join your study and trust that they can join it and then actually stay in the study because you've provided them with resources and made it um, such that they can they can stay involved in the study. So that, that's one way that we've been starting to mm. think about and, and plan for and, and done in a couple of couple of centers to date. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, Kathy, maybe pulling on from, from what Julian's just said, I think, you know, bringing that patient voice into design and execution, and Julian, you just said, I mean, sometimes people simply economically can't afford to take time out of work to get across the city to get to the site. So Kathy, I mean, how are you working that into your plans to make you know, studies more, I guess, practical for patients. Yeah. How has that worked? Yeah, well, um, I agree. I mean, I, and I think you have to ask the, the patients or the caregivers, I, I, you have to incorporate the patient preference. And that's everything from what kind of testing they have to do to how often they have to travel, to where they have to travel, how long that takes. I mean, you know, I think a lot of times we just assume people can just take off of work um to to go and do all of these crazy things and and they can't um you know and especially now during covid um not only can't people go certain places but some are really worried to go anywhere so i think you have to continue again to bring that patient perspective in and that's across you know all of diseases all diverse communities but you need to you really do need to ask the questions from the patients and the caregivers that's where i think we need to start and I think Julian, um, actually a couple of you all hit on it earlier, you know, we've been talking about this and it's been swirling for for years. Um, but I think, um, you know, the, that now that the regulators are asking, um, you know, for more patient patient input into drug development, um, it's it's making it easier to be able to, you know, impact and, and, and create these initiatives where we can bring the patient voice in. Before it was a big no-no, like, oh, yeah. you know, we don't want to keep it the firewall, we don't want to be talking to one another, where, you know, the patients at the end of the day um, and their caregivers and their families are really, you know, that's what we're all working you know, yeah. for and to help. So we need to ask the questions and we need to listen. We need to listen. So, Kathy, I want to pick up on a couple of things you said. So, I think it is good to see regulators bringing together two elements, right? So, I think the patient-focused drug development that a guidance as the agency committed to are definitely landmark. But I think, I think having those things joined up with what the Office of Minority Health at the agency is doing as well, and the fact that the Rear Admiral is able to go out and do a lot of these presentations and try and bring that in is really critical. Um, you know, that, that's definitely front and center. Um, I think the other part that comes out of that too is eventually, will regulators start to mandate that we have scientifically balanced data packages, right? Because yeah. we've all seen the numbers say in myeloma where the data is all upside down with all those drug approvals and the agency's aware of it, they can dissect through those data. So that's gonna be interesting. What a, could I maybe come to you you know, you mentioned an interesting transition that many of your sites are looking at going from NCI sponsored work to pharma work. What, I mean, what advice would you have to the audience and to the panel about lessons learned from NCORP that might translate out into pharmaceutical sponsored research? What are the key learnings you think you've had out of that? Well, you know, I think we, all of the NCI sponsor sites, um, never get enough funding. I, I don't know how, whether people think we're for not, but we never get 100% funding. But, you know, we know that our sites uh, complement their funding by pharma trials. It's very interesting because in the past, what we would hear from the sites was that, that the, even though it was shorter term because the trials were not as long a duration, was so complex and that they had so much data to collect. It's almost balanced out now because for two reasons. One is that, as uh, Kathy has mentioned, people want, there's more patient participation, certainly patient reported outcomes, we want more information. We're also now interested in social determinants. So you want to add in another couple pages of demographic information that you want to collect. So, you know, I, I think what we have learned is that you can't ask for so much of, of the patients. 
I have been thinking recently um, that, you know, with the uh, flexibility that is now in place uh, as a policy uh, since COVID about doing more telemedicine, if that's actually going to help us. Um, because patients come in, you know, for specific issues, follow up treatment. And although we do fairly well in collecting data, these patients want to go home. They want to be home. So maybe, you know, this may be a, a way to help us. And back to your original point of question, particularly for our treatment trials, you know, there's greater collaboration now with these precision trials with pharma than there ever was. So I think that too places sort of a different requirement on the trials. And I think my last point is, um, I think that there's a different way that you present clinical trials. Um, you know, I trained at an institution where you went into the room and you, you really were about trials. You had a little black book I'm dating myself about clinical trials. But I, I, I think that um, it's a different language. It's a different uh, manner. It's a different length of time that you have to now spend with your patient to enroll them in clinical trials. And I think in that sense, there's really no difference, I, I think, between the pharma because, um, you know, our physicians have told us in some situations that, you know, if you're talking about some of the genetic risk and, and some of the complications of, you know, learning the variant and all those things, they're not exactly informed on that. I mean, there's a lot of education about that, and education about not only the science, but how you present the science to them, how you answer those questions that patients may, you know, have very questions. Well, you know, if I do this testing, what does it mean? Um, you know, specifically, what does it mean? So I, I think that we've learned a lot from pharma in terms of the complexities of trials. And I think it's, it's, it's been two ways. Because I think farmers learning, I think perhaps um, from some of the community input that has informed us about, um, you know, barriers to trials. I mean, poverty, social injustice, right. um, and, and just fears that many populations have about trials. So I think it's been two ways. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's well said. We're actually just to tie together something you said with what Kathy was saying about education and listening, right? I think for a long time as a, as a community of, of sort of drug developers, we've done a good job about trying to educate patients about clinical trials and what they are. But at this point, I think it's much more about patients educating us about why can't they get to a trial? How do we help them with those barriers, whether it's money to get across town, or they don't understand the procedures, or why can't I do this at home with telemedicine? How do we simplify protocols? I think we need to all develop a much better ear for listening to our patients. And particularly, I think, you know, in the community where some patients are not even getting into the healthcare system yet. How do we, how do we address that? That's a foundational issue. Um, it's, you know, very important that we, that we do that. Um, you know, Jim, I'd like to come to you maybe for a question. You know, we've talked about labor force and and change in that setting. You know, beyond that sort of core group of stakeholders, what do you see as the biggest change we need to make at the study site level for that outreach? Is it institutional change to demolish bias? Is it simply that we have a more diverse staff? Is it some combination of that? What do you think we're running into? Well, you know, there's 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 some deep-seated mistrust, right? We're all aware of that. Um, I think overcoming that is probably our largest barrier. And I think, uh, you know, again, one solution is is having having site staff. And I don't just mean the PI or the physician. I, I mean all the staff the supports, you know, the study coordinators and, and in particular, because they spend a lot of time with the patients. I think having... Um, you know, have, having them as good quality study coordinators and being able to communicate effectively with populations um, that are, are similar to themselves, you know, with cult same cultural background, I think that's probably the, the, most, um, the most effective methodology. And that being said, uh, you know, that's not a one-size-fits-all solution either. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that needs to be done around educating uh, current investigator site staff on how to communicate effectively to your point how to listen is absolutely <clears throat> how to how to how to look for signs you know that people understand or don't understand or you know are, are you are you effectively getting the idea across and, and vice versa um, you know I think 
COVID's been a really interesting example of this in that we we when you know, we saw the Moderna trials had to slow down because they were they didn't have the right populations that the that the right. folks were looking for. Um, the good news is they got they got people in, but but the bad news is that it had to slow them down. So how do we make this just part of our day to day activities? The way we are as an industry approach our enrollment targets and. Right. Um, you know, again, I think I think it really comes down to effective communication. I don't know what the answer is to breaking down some of the distrust. I'm not sure what that is. I'm hoping there's some way we could do some type of a national campaign or something. I, I don't have the answer. Other than having people work directly with individuals who are from the same background and can communicate more effectively, perhaps, than someone who yeah. isn't. So, yeah, I mean, I think that last point, Jim, I want to pick up on something that Dr. Sandoval shared with us last week. Um, you know, it really begins by, from his perspective, it really begins with acknowledging the problem and not just trying to say, well, you know, that's history, don't worry about it, or, you know, you shouldn't worry about these things. I do this all the time. I'm a, I'm a drug developer, I'm a physician, right? It's listening and acknowledging is the first step. You know, and a lot of Dr. Sandoval's patients are in the, the Latinx community in DC. And he actually had to begin by investing a lot of time in community outreach, just about basic healthcare before even contemplating clinical trials. Because if you don't trust the healthcare system, you're not gonna trust the clinical trial, right? So it really is that fundamental, right? Yeah. Great, so. great point, yeah. And, and he's established quite a good reputation around, well, I live in the DC area too. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's on Telemundo, so he's able to share good health information in general and has created quite a, a very positive reputation for himself and his clinic. Yeah, and I think that sort of, to me, it goes to something we've all talked about, which is that outreach into the community and sort of demolishing fears and barriers and listening and putting it in terms that people can understand and appreciate. Because certainly, you know, you think about an oncology trial, if the first time you hear about healthcare and clinical research is when you've just had a terrible diagnosis, that's not the right time for somebody to be reading you a 40 page informed yeah. consent. That's, you know, potentially way over your head, right? So, you know, uh, Nick, I, I should point out that Syscript, uh, if, if everyone's familiar with Syscript, they've been doing a good job of trying to reach out and raise awareness amongst patients of clinical research and what it's about and, and why it's a good thing to participate in. And they've, they've also been uh, very focused on diversifying the patient populations to raise awareness for those groups. Yeah, that has been nice work. So, so you know, one thing I'd like to ahead. point out is is that you know disparities don't happen in a vacuum and i think we need to appreciate the fact that you know we, we talk about um disparities and for a very large portion of underserved populations there are the chronic diseases hypertension diabetes highly prevalent in communities so you know if someone has has um, cancer and they also have hypertension or diabetes or whatever, and you just really focus on their cancer, that's, I mean, we need to do that, of course, but that patient has a lot of other things that they have to think about. Um, yeah. Also need to think about whether the intervention is going to alter their um, chronic disease and its management. And it also brings into play the important role that the primary care physicians who's taking care of that patient plays, both in the fact that, you know, when patients go to their private, uh, um, internists at family medicines, you know, if they have that, um, they say, well, you know, Dr. McCastle Sieber wants me to participate in clinical trial. What do you think? And if he, she's been out of the system of research, yeah. they would say, mm, I'm not really sure. Yeah. But I, I think the other point is that, you know, we're thinking about ways in which we can co-manage patients because that's extremely important. You know, many of the larger institutions are uh, releasing their patients, you know, who have had adjuvant therapy back, you know, to their uh, referring physicians or primary care physicians. So I think that it's, you know, we need to think a little differently about how we, we manage uh, cancer patients and, and with, uh, in disparities in particular in, in chronic diseases. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's ubiquitous. It's not, it's underserved yeah. populations, but the uh, obesity uh, rates that it has, you know, it's only going to continue. Yeah, no, I, I think that's very well said, Water. And particularly, you know, the point you're making about primary care physicians is a point of reference and trust. If it falls apart there, then it really has fallen apart, right? So we're not going to get anywhere. But guys, I'm conscious of time. We've gone through this very quickly. We've got a few minutes left. I'm just going to go around the, the table here and ask if you had one key message you would like the audience to take away from your own experience 
what would that be? And Kathy, I maybe start with you. Yeah, I think, well, I think we've all been talking about it, you know, having to, to listen, listen to the patients, listen <clears throat> to, um, you know, those, those people who are going to be most affected. And, and I also think, you know, just from listening to Warda, what you were saying and, and, and Jim as well, um, you know, kind of thinking outside of the box a little bit too, um, to work with different organizations or different groups that maybe we haven't really in the past and listening to them too, so. Yeah. Julian, from your perspective? Yeah, I think for me, it was a great discussion today. and Great to be on this panel. Thank you. Some really good learnings. Made a lot of notes. Uh, I think for me, it's it's just seek the information that's there. That there's there's a there's literally a ton of it, and then just do what you think is is most practical for you. And if you do it well, and if you actually do it, you'll you'll enroll faster. There's no cost to this. Actually, it's more cost effective if you pick a more diverse population and you go after a more diverse population because your site selection and your patient patient engagement, your patient involvement, the whole thing will be enhanced um, and it'll 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 actually go go smoother than not doing it. Um, so yeah, there's lots of advice that I would just, you know, you use what's already available. Yeah, no, I think that's that's solid, Julian. Thank you. Uh, Jim, from your perspective. Yeah, I think one way, one thing I would ask folks to think about is, you know, you have you have a um, usually a trial strategy to make sure you get the right population. You might have a strategy across the development of a specific drug as well. But but also keep in mind the big picture long range strategy. And the long range strategy, I think we talked a lot about it today. It's reducing the disparity in healthcare. It's making sure we have the right workforce in place. It's and that includes not only sites. I should mention it also includes within your organization, you know. Yes. So you get those perspectives, um, and and I, I agree. Overall, listening is the key, and and really understanding or trying to understand, you know, uh, the, the dynamics of all this. But but again, I think it's important that we have short-term strategies, long-term strategies, and it's going to take time, I believe, to really work through this issue because. Frankly, we've been, we've been working on it for 20 years. You know, it's been a long time. Now's the time to really come together. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it, maybe this is the the pivotal moment in history where this may happen. I, I hope. I'm an optimist. I hope that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we'd all agree with that. That you know, the, the sort of the new light that has been shown on this issue by COVID and social injustice in the past year is really an opportunity that collectively we have to grab. We can't let this go. This, right, it, we'll shoot ourselves if we do that. What, uh, from, from your perspective, what, what message would you like the audience to take away from your work? Well, I think coming from a community perspective, I, I think it has to be a, a very complementary team in order to do this. Um, I, I, I just want us to continue in the direction that we can um, get to social justice because it's so hard to tease those pieces together. Um, I, I think we need to be very aware of uh, changing financial situations and that we listen to our patients so that we can inform our clinical research so that it can be more applicable to, to everyone so that we don't leave people out to get to cancer equity and healthcare equity in general. You know, well, I think that's a great note to end on. Don't leave people out. There should be equity of access to clinical trials as part of the healthcare continuum. I think we'd all we'd all agree with that. Well, listen, just as a wrap up, I would like to sincerely thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this for this panel discussion. I think there's been some great points. We probably could have talked about this all day. Uh, I do mm -hmm. hope we all keep in touch, both together as well as with the rest of our community. And again, thanks to all of you. Uh, Ryan, at this point, I'll pass it back to you to wrap it up. I just want to take a moment now to, I suppose, thank you all very much for that insightful presentation. Uh, we have reached the end of the webinar today. If we couldn't attend to your questions, though, the team at Cineos Health may follow up with you, or if you have further questions, you can visit Cineos' Insights Hub online. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. 
Now, I'm about to send you a link uh, in the chat box. Uh, and with this link, you'll be able to view a recording of this event on this page. I also encourage you to share this link with your colleagues. And now please join us in thanking then our speakers, all of you for your time today. We hope that you found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.